It's my privilege to introduce and to welcome King Costa with us today. He's South African born, but London based now. We won't keep that against him. <laughs> um, he's a, a banker, a Christian businessman. He's been involved with a lot of ventures. He's also written a book, God at Work. There's a website, God at Work, with a lot of tools. You can go and look at that. Um, but for me personally, one of the, the things that stand out is he's the chairperson of Alpha International. And Alpha International is this transformative process program that people go on as introduction towards faith. And across the globe, 27 million people has already been, uh, has went, uh, gone through that program. And um, Ken is also married. He's got four children, and um, we're looking to forward to your message this morning. Welcome. Bye, thank you, uh, Tian. It is for me a besonder voorrecht that Johan me genoe het om jylle gemeenskap toe te spreek. Ek was so beindruk met my ervarings tydens my besoek hier, dat ek opgewonde was toe hy my gevraad. Jylle geloof, jylle vertrouwe in Jesus Christus, jylle gemeenskap geloof, en jylle leierskap span is waarlik indrukwekkend. Daar is echter een ander rede. Ek is immers een plaas Jaapie. Ek het groot geword in een plaasskool in een hoofdzakelijk Afrikaanse deel van die land. En ek het nie ooit gedink dat ek een publieke toespraak in Afrikaans sou gedoen. Afrikaans is nie my voertaal nie. So hierdie is maar een paar woorde waarmee ek probeer spogerig te wees om te sê of ek dit kan hanteer oor leef of bemeester. Maar ongeacht die taal, ongeacht die... Thank you. Ongeacht die taal, ongeacht die kultuur, waar ook al jy is, Jesus Christus is Heere en sy gees bewerkstellig hy die grootste gemeenskap wat die wereld ooit sal ken. Don't worry, I won't torture you anymore. Was that okay? Well, it's nice to get a clap. I'll do it again. Shall I still? So I was, uh, I told you I grew up in a farm school and uh, we in the Bible class uh, Miss Hubert was uh, telling us about his son flute and who did for 40 days and 40 nights aanhoudend and deerdrungend gereen. When Yanni de Preer puts his hand up and said, Jeffro, was he boer to tevreden? <laughs> so as you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a rugby time and I've... Um, been to Twickenham for the last three games and every team that I supported has lost. So yesterday, in order to give South Africa a chance, if you want to know why you won, it was because I was supporting Wales and I have a completely unbroken record. Now, as you know, when, uh, when nasty things happen, you know, when dare I remind you, when South Africa lost to Japan or when England lost, <laughs> um, the, the social media goes mad and you know you get pictures and you get stories get sent to you. So one of them was the following, I hope it's okay to tell it to you. Teacher turns to the class and says to, says to the children, I want you to tell me what your daddy does. And so the children got up and said, my daddy does this, my daddy does this, my daddy does that. And Tommy gets up, looks rather sad and says, well, my daddy is a stripper in a nightclub and he does horrible things. And sometimes my mummy is very unhappy. The teacher sees the story and she, she says to the class, go, go and play, go and play. She turns to Tommy and says to him, Tommy, is this true? Oh no, miss. But you see, my daddy plays rugby for England, and I was too embarrassed to say so. <laughs> and um, I want to talk about 
little and large. Little acts have large effects. And while we're talking about rugby, I want to just mention to you that where rugby started, started in rugby school in England, uh, when William Webb Ellis, which of course is the name of the World Cup, um, while he was playing soccer, football, um, did something completely against the rules. He picked up the ball. And maybe you remember this clipping.
in Mozambique. Isn't that amazing? A small thing, a small act, but a large effect. And I know that you have great visions and your pastors are a remarkable man and you have wonderful big visions and that's wonderful that you should do so. But I want to ask you if you will just allow me for today to ask you to have a small one. Because I want to talk about small things that make hope grow. It's amazing that you're doing this series on strengthening hope. But it starts by looking at some of the small acts which have large effects in the economy of the kingdom of God. Always, small acts have large effects because God is interested more in the attitude of your heart than in the act of your hand. Quite recently, Pope Francis issued a bull, but that's not a rugby term, that's what the Pope's letter is called. And he said this, he said, we need a conviction that less is more. A constant flood of new consumer goods can baffle the heart and prevent us from cherishing each thing and each moment. To be serenely present to each reality, however small it may be, opens us to much greater horizons of understanding and personal fulfillment. Christian spirituality proposes a growth marked by moderation and the capacity to be happy with little. It's a return to that simplicity which allows us to stop and to appreciate the small things, to be grateful for the opportunities which life affords us, to be spiritually detached from what we possess and not to succumb to the sadness of what we lack. This implies the avoiding the dynamic of dominion and the mere accumulation of pleasures. To be serenely present to each reality, however small it may be. I think that's a real word for us. However small it may be. So shall we turn to to the text that we had so beautifully read to us. Uh, Luke um, chapter 13 uh, and verse 18. Uh, when Jesus compares the kingdom of God. See, Jesus is saying, I want to tell you what the kingdom of God is like. Now, if I were to ask someone today, tell me about the most powerful, tell me about a kingdom, because kingdoms would be powerful like a state. You'd say, well, maybe the United States has got the most powerful weapon arsenal on the planet or China has the largest economy maybe a little slowing at the moment but the largest economy on the planet you'd think of something big something powerful something enormous so when Jesus says what is the kingdom of God like what shall I compare it to you would expect people to say oh the mighty Roman Empire greater than Rome greater than Greece and Jesus says it is like a mustard seed. Wow. They must have thought the guy's nuts. I don't want to be part of a kingdom that's like a mustard seed. But a mustard seed, as you know, in the time was the smallest of the seeds. Tiny seed. He went on to say, and it's like yeast that a person puts, a woman puts into 60 pounds of flour. And do you know what happens when you put yeast in? It grows by 70 times. That Jesus is the multiplying God. He takes small acts and gives them 70 times their effect. That's what our God does. That is what Jesus does. He's the multiplying God. But he does mean that we need to learn one or two very simple things. I just love I was sitting next to France early on and I was saying to you, isn't it amazing that Jesus uses such utterly simple stories but he does mean us to learn one or two things so let's just look at it what shall I compare it to it's like a mustard seed which a man or a person took so the first thing to notice is you have to take now if you're anything like me you'll um, listen to people preaching and 
will take a message um, but sometimes you don't hear it very well but, but the first step is that you say I take that message I just take what the person is saying I grasp what you're saying I, 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 think, I think she's making a good point but you know like me I sort of look I didn't know anything about gardening so I look at a packet of seeds and I say oh this is a nice packet of seeds there's a pretty picture there are a lot of little seeds in it it's nicely packaged got some words on it but I never take the seed. So the first step is utterly crucial, is, not, is that we should take something, we should take a message. And then Jesus says the second thing, and plant it. And plant it. It's no good just to take a message, to hear a message. It has to be planted. And that's where our faith comes in, is that we, by faith, have to take a little seed and plant it into the ground. Believe that God has spoken to you. Believe that God has given you a skepungsdul, if I remember the word. A creation purpose, unique to you. Nobody else has it, nobody else will ever have it. But wherever you are, he has given you a seed that he wants you to plant. But you say, well, well, yes, but where do I plant? I'm sitting at work. I'm having a rough time in my work. I, 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 finances are tight. Life is very difficult. You know, where do you want me to plant? If I look at my friends, they've got bigger cars, better houses, more money, better educated. Jesus says, plant in your garden. He doesn't say, go and scatter it out throughout the world. He doesn't say, go and have a, a, go and have a, a look at your neighbor's garden and plant some of the gifts that you've got in your neighbor's garden. He doesn't say that. What he says is, plant it in your garden in the place where he calls you you will bloom in the place where he calls you to be where you are planted the gifts that you have that you will take it is in your backyard in your work in your skill set in your grace level in your in the way in, the, in your experienced place that's what it is it's not in your neighbor's garden it's wherever you are active in this church in the remarkable things that you are doing here it's the, the small things that you plant together with other people and that is, a, that is an extraordinary promise because what he then says it grew and nothing can grow unless it's planted but it grew and became a tree and the birds perched in it a wonderful image of what when you start something little a little act planting a seed a large effect a tree grows and the birds of the air come and live in that tree this is a description of this community that as you grow together people will want to come and see and be like those birds in the tree in that mosaic tree that uh, you are planting where in your community, in this area, in the people that you're feeding, in the place where God has called you to. You see, it's always the little acts that show the attitude of the heart. The little acts. we listen to the voice of God a little voice can have a large volume you remember Elijah in chapter 19 of the book of Kings Elijah was depressed Jezebel wanted to kill him the prophets were were the false prophets were at him and you know what he, he was saying he rushed to a cave and in that cave came the wind and the earthquake and the fire. Do you know what it's like sometimes in life when we see the winds of change in our workplace? We don't know how to cope with them. The earthquake of uncertainties, of finance, bereavement, ill health, 
and distress, the fire of temptation and, uh, and doing the wrong things that come at us. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of stuff in our lives. And then, but a large volume. And Jesus Christ speaks to us in little things. Just think of, a, of Elijah again. Elijah had promised that rain would come. And he goes out waiting on a mountaintop for the rain to come. And he sends his servant out to go and see once. Is it there? Twice. Can you see anything? Three. Uh, where is the rain? Four. Are you sure? No. Five times. Six times. And on the seventh time, a cloud as small as a man's hand rose from the sea. And the rain was on its way. A little signal. A little signal. A cloud as small as a man's hand. But a, la a little sign. But a large signal. And so often in our lives there are little signs that give large signals. I remember when I was working on a very complicated financial transaction with a colleague of mine and we were utterly stressed uh, in, in, in doing it. And I just said to him, Pete, do you want to come for a walk across London Bridge? That's all I said. I didn't necessarily tell him all the good news of Jesus Christ at the time because he needed, as I did, just to know that somebody was interested in walking him over London Bridge and walking him back across London Bridge. It was a little sign. Twenty years later, he said it was the large signal of his life that somebody was interested in him. Honestly, I didn't do anything. I just walked across a bridge. But little signs have large signals. A little risk has a large reward. You know the parable of the talents when the, the servants came and they, they took the risk to see the investment return. It was a little risk they had to take. Definitely a risk. You cannot see an increment if you're not prepared to take a risk. Your faith cannot grow without a risk being taken. The risk of taking the seed and planting it that's the risk. You don't know what the, whether the tree will grow, but you've got to trust that God will let that tree grow. A little risk, a large reward. My good friend is, is Rick Warren. He wrote a book called uh, The Purpose Driven Life. It's the largest selling book in the English language nonfiction other than the Bible. Over 50 million copies have been sold worldwide. And I said to Rick, I said to him, Rick, surely you, when you came into these vast um, amounts of money, it must have unsettled you. you know, you're a pastor, really. I'm not used to sort of these sums of money. And he said, Campbell, you see, it happened like this. When we got married, Kay and I decided that every year we would tithe our, our money. But every year we would add a little more. And we did that for 30 years. And in the 30th year, nobody knew about this. Only the two of them knew. In the 30th year, they were reverse tithing. They were giving 90% away and keeping 10%. And that was when the book exploded. And that was when he says... Jesus could look to him and say, I know that you can be faithful with a large amount. But it started with a little risk of just increasing every year that which he was giving. Selfless acts in obedience to Jesus have significant, sustainable effects. But you say to me, well, can that's great, but do you know what? How do you do this? How do you do this? It's a tough world. You don't have to tell me about stress. And I don't have to tell you about it. We know about it. It's tough out there. So here's a few practical things that I've found helpful for my 
myself. The first is start small. Don't have some great big vision of what you can achieve. Just for the moment, start small. Plant a seed. Ask the Spirit of God to let you know what it is that you uniquely have. You can come alongside a friend, talk to a neighbor, help somebody at work, forgive somebody who's irritating you in your workplace. You can give of your finances, of your time, of your energy that will build hope. Start small. Second, stay at it for six weeks. Why six weeks? Because that's what psychologists tell us. You need to establish a habit or to break a habit. And then thirdly, do it step by step. Don't just make some great big gesture. Step by step. I had the great privilege of watching Andy Murray play at Wimbledon when he was at Centre Court and won, uh, won Wimbledon. And afterwards, there was this interview all with Murray. Uh, and they asked him about the match uh, and how he'd beaten Djokovic. And he said this, I think I persevered. That's really been it. It's the story of my career. I had a, love, enough of, I had a lot of tough losses. But the one thing I would say is I think every year I improved a little bit. They weren't major improvements, massive changes. But every year my ranking was going in the right direction. If you keep improving steadily and you aren't distracted by setbacks, you're bound to win eventually. Steadily little by little. And you know, we need to have this journey shared. Start small, stay six weeks, step by step, share the journey. Why is that? Well, because we have an enemy. I mean, many of you would have been uh, out in the, in the bush. You know what a lion is like, and the Bible tells us in in Peter that the, you know our adversary the lion is a roar the devil as a roaring lion goes about seeking whom he can devour but you know what happens if you know, there's a lone buffalo a lion can roar at uh, at the buffalo and kill that buffalo and the roar of a lion is a terrifying experience i've experienced it a lion coming just that close walking by me only god and my dry cleaner knows how scared I was. But collectively, together, here's a picture. Look what a buffalo together can do to a lion. Where is the mighty roaring lion? It's not because there's one buffalo there. It's because there's a whole herd around them forcing them away. And that's what we do when we share together. That's why a community of hope is a community that strengthens each other against the adversary that comes at us. But as I was saying, you cannot just expect that God to be Google. He doesn't just answer immediately. The time of planting and the time of harvesting is a gap. So it is with your money. If you give to to a church say or whatever it is it's an investment it doesn't have an immediate response it grows in the community into the tree that we have for the birds around to be in that tree but we have to look after what God has given us to plant it I want to show you a picture of a greenhouse in Kent where they had an agave plant an agave plant is a small plant from which we, we get tequila. And they had it there, and for 40 years, they, plant, they poured water and tended this little plant. Sometimes you have to wait for God. And then this year, in six months, that plant grew 30 feet. And look at the consequence. It went straight through. They had to take the tiles off. It pushed through the tiles of the of the greenhouse it broke through the top and that is what happens when the spirit of god moves in your heart and says
says to you, here is what I have given you. Take it, plant it, put it in the soil, in the area that I have called you to be. Bloom where you are planted. Don't let anybody, least of all yourself, place a ceiling on your ambition, box in your hope, because the Spirit of God breaks through the roof, just as he did in that picture. The Spirit of the living God who is working within you, taking the smallest little seed, is enabling you today to take the steps that will make this huge change to your life and a huge change to the lives of the people that are around you. A little act has a large effect. A little voice has a large volume. A little sign has a large signal. And a little risk has a large reward. Why? Because the Spirit of the living God says to you, you can grow where you are planted. If you start small, you will see something growing and nothing, least of all the the expectations of others or of yourself can drop you down, force you back, because the Spirit of God will see you growing into the person that he longs you to be, the person that he's made you to be. And it is true that acts, sometimes it's hard work, but this is true, that acts that are inspired by the self are unbearable. But acts, small acts, that are inspired by the Spirit are unbeatable. Where are we sitting? Can we pray? I'd like you, if I may, to, in this minute, to do something simple, because the whole of Jesus' message was simple. Little, th- little acts, large effects. Perhaps you could, just where you are, press your thumb and your forefinger together, pretending for the moment that you have a little seed in there and just hold it firmly, take it. That little seed represents whatever God has called you to do. Whatever he has spoken to you as I am speaking to you, whatever he has said to you that you should do this week, something small, don't do anything big just for this week. Just take it. And I want to pray for you. If you bow your head while you hold this, feel the tension. Take it firmly. Maybe there's a decision that you need to take, which you kind of know you have to, but you haven't yet. Make firm that which is weak. A decision to stop doing stuff that's displeasing to God, looking at stuff that you shouldn't be looking at, being more greedy than you could, giving more of your finances, something that's not very strong. Make it firm now. If you bow your heads, I'd love to pray for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would touch each and every person here by your Spirit, that you will enable them to plant the gift that you've given them specifically to you. No one else has it to be the person that God longs you to be. Come, Holy Spirit, come, make Jesus real in the lives of each person here so that we can see this tree of life, this tree of this community in mosaic grow to a place where the birds, the people around can find help, can find uh, love, can find hope because your people have been faithful. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, Ken. Let's give Ken a hand. As jy behoefte het aan persoonlijke gebed, of selfs dat iemand saam met jou moet bid, die Klipkerk is beskikbaar as een spasie, en as ons die klaas is, jy welkom om soen toe te gaan. Um, ons keier buiten op die piaatse met lekker koffie en thee, soos jy ingekom het, sê jy sien die communie is vol ekspou goed, dis die seisoen waar in ons is. Ons hartklip verskillende bevondsingsinitiatiewe, waarmee ons fondse in, juist vir die projekte van koos gee en ons sociale opheffingsprojekte. So nooi mense, stuur die boodskap uit, sê ekspou is daar, so is een wonderlijke geleentheid, 
Um, ons het ook graag Expressing Hou Benefit Concert, nou een paar vrienden en familie en kom join ons saam hier so. Kom ons sluit af en ontvang die Seen van die Heere. Die genade van die Heere Jesus Christus, die liefde van God die Vader en die gemeenskap van die Heilige Geest is en bly met elkeen van julle en gaan in die vrede van die Heere.